They're basically having good meetings and outpouring. Um, can't, I'd say probably it might be revival. They've had a few people saved. Um, been good for the church and some of the leaders to be encouraged. Um, but, you know, we're, we are in a new era. Everybody's talking about it now. It's like it's starting to just swing through the whole body of Christ. Something new has shifted. And, you know, we have Ray coming next week, and we probably lost track of it a little bit, but he's supposed to be releasing the sounds of a new era. Yep. So uh, him and Jim Nesbitt, they're doing something along that with the exact same title. And then Ray sent in some books, and I said, well, I better look at the books he's brought in you know, see what, what he did he bring. And so one of the books he brought actually is talking about the, the sounds, uh, the new sounds that are coming. And he just published it last year. So I already snagged a copy for myself and put it in my bag, and I'll pay for it later. <laughs> Make sure I get one. Um, but, you know, I think that we're in, a, we're in a season where last season's ended and we're in a new, a new moment of time that's starting to emerge. So I, I took on this week, and you probably, most of you know on Facebook, I took on the uh, overseeing the Global Friends and the Together International Network, both of them, uh, as their apostle. And we got the summit plan, a summit plan for Global Friends uh, probably in October of this year, and we're talking about us hosting it here, which would bring in all of the Global Friends um, probably about 75, 80 people that are outside of our sphere but are in our sphere or whatever that they would be coming. So it would be all my friends out of Canada, the First Nations people, Willie Jaw, Kenny Blacksmith. It could be Nigel Big Pond. I mean, it could be a pretty good chunk of people. And we would host that event here possibly. So um, David is going to try. David Rosen is going to try to come for the summit. He's going to try to bring a pretty good chunk of global friends if he can. He may bring 10 or 15 of them, kind of handpick some people. And we talked about Carlisle and all the things going on at Carlisle with the, you know, and um, he's feeling a real draw into Carlisle. And we have four more children that have went home from Carlisle. So the thing of relocating those um, First Nations children back to the reservations for burial and reservation is becoming reality. So I think that's seven or eight out of 120 so far. And the momentum is picking up on it more. More and more people are wanting to give money to it. And um, somebody just recently pledged $10,000 to help relocate these kids. So... Um, what happened, we talked about what happened was a heart of compassion gripped people out of that meeting. Um, and so Dave and we had a very honest conversation and talk about stuff. And so I uh, feel like we're moving into a new dimension. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't think any of us understand what it's going to look like yet. Um, we're going to try to figure that all out, I guess, and have all the answers in the summit time. Yeah, right. Well, tonight I want to talk about a new era, the sounds of a new era. Um, try to get us set up a little bit for, um, for Ray coming. Try to get us set up for the summit coming. Start leading us into the next segment of what we're doing. And when you start looking at new eras on the earth, every time there was a new era, there was a lot of rejoicing that happened. Uh, past season had ended a season of suffering, heartache, hardships, all those kinds of things ends up being more of a, a, a season of rejoicing. You think of when Jesus came into the earth, it was an unbelievable season of rejoicing. Angelic visitations, the earth was starting to get an answer to its groaning. There was singing, there was prophesying, there was people realizing, you know, the possibilities of God were finally coming. And so what always happens is when there's a new era, there's a release of a sound out of people. And people are the sound carriers of new eras. Uh, they carry the era of a sound. We all are made up right now as, as Christianity is unfolded in our hearts. We're actually all like sound carriers of past moves of God. Uh, we, we're carrying sounds that 
of revivals. We're carrying sounds of um, times that God visited the earth. You know, it's kind of like the uh, the pin that the pin that like uh, you know Ray will probably bring a bunch of these pins, and if you're interested in buying one, they're a hundred and twenty five dollars, but they go to missions. But these pins are made from the wood of the Red Red River Meeting House, where the Great Awakening in America started, and the reason he he wanted the wood was because he said. And if you look at, look at sound, sound goes into everything. The sounds of this room are going into the wood. They're going into the things. They're going into your physical body. Your physical body absorbs sound, not just through your ears, but through your body itself. Your ears are attached to different organs, and your ears are what you hear is either making your body healthy or it's dissolving your body, making your body unhealthy. So he, you know, he's like, do you realize that this wood was there when the awakening started? And this wood actually heard the sounds of awakening. And this tree, which was a massive tree when it fell over, was a small tree when it was, that revival was there. And that tree grew with the sound of awakening and revival setting inside of it. And when you start looking at quantum physics and looking at sound, I'm not going to do all that because he'll do all that next week, hopefully. Um, when you start looking at all those things, you realize that we are absorbing sound and the sound is having an effect. That's why the Bible says, be careful what you hear and all kinds of different things. But when we start talking about the sounds of a new era, you look at Acts 2, you see the outpouring of God came and there was sound that was released there. There were sounds that they heard of a people in their own tongue. They heard tongues from heaven. That, and what happens when sound starts getting released or an era starts emerging is it starts shifting the language that people are speaking. The language, ta- uh, the t- conversation starts shifting. Do you imagine at the time of Christ what shifted was the language about the cross, redemption, the Messiah, 400 silent years have ended. There's now a sound that's upon the earth. They are talking about what's going on around them. And probably even the most common person who was, didn't believe or anything was still talking about what was happening upon the earth. When the awakening happened at Cane Ridge, Red River, that sound people were talking about. It's why people came to those locations. There were sounds that they were hearing about about the most uncommon things, but yet God was doing something. And so it started sparking, actually, wonderment about what God was doing. Even probably at the time of Christ, they were, they were asking, is this the return of the kingdom? And the questions started coming. So when a new era comes, there's a lot of questions about the future. And there's also a lot of questions about, is the world coming to an end, or is, are we getting finished with what we have been doing, and we're coming into something different. So when a new era comes, it starts shifting your affections and your values. It starts affecting your heart. God starts dealing in hearts. You have to close things off of your past, and you have to open up new seasons upon the earth. And so probably there's people in transition right now, and I know there are, who are having to close the past off. Because you can't drag the past into the next season. And as good as things were in the past season, you still can't take that into the next season. There's ministries that I know right now in Kentucky that have closed. They've closed their ministry because they want the next season and they don't want to drag something from the past season into the next season. And so they, they, they just plain decided to do that. And so what happens is when a new season or era comes, It's something that has been longed for, expected for, anticipated for. When a new season starts coming, everybody has a longing in their heart for that which is there. And that, I think, is where we are actually at right now because this new season is moving us from one moment of a prophetic fulfillment because that's what's happening when the past season closes is the past season's closing. Prophetic fulfillment has come because apostolic destiny is being released. And so in John 7, I will use the Bible. In John 7, 6, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, 
My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. Which really translates like this. Jesus said unto them, my keros is not yet come. My divine moment has not yet come. Meaning, I have not came to the closing of my season and the opening of my next season, the cross, but your keros is already here. In other words, your new season is setting right here in front of you. It's actually, here I am, here's Christ. And so basically, we're coming into this next season, and we've been talking about this for a little bit now, that what we're coming into is that the kingdom requires apostolic Christianity to emerge. That is part of this next season. I find it interesting that I get this text message tonight making that statement I just did. It's like apostolic Christianity is emerging in this next season and there's going to be the recognition of apostles and there's going to be the embrace of that gift. And I fi- I'm, just, I'm just as blown out of the water as you all are about that text message. But it's like this is what's starting to emerge. And so that is really the era because here's what this era is. It is a redemptive purpose through regeneration. And you know, I've talked about regeneration and the, it's a biblical principle. It's a Christian principle of God that God regenerates. So there's a regeneration. So the era we're entering into is a redemptive, there's a redemptive purpose of God that's setting, that's coming through regeneration into the earth And what God is doing right now is he's establishing a demarcation line. There is a a line that's being dropped, and it's literally like he's showing before and after. And that line is going to start to widen. And some of you, it's probably been widening. Others, it's, it's going to widen. And so what he's doing is he's showing the extreme opposites. Whenever God started a new season, it was the extreme opposites of time that he started showing. So he's showing, here is Egypt, and here is the promised land. Here is bondage, here is freedom. Here is them providing, here is me providing. There was these extreme opposites that he showed, and there was a demarcation line that was dropped into the middle of it. Really, the Red Sea was kind of like the demarcation line. And it widened, remember, there was a long ways across that thing. And so that demarcation line has a weight to it. And that becomes part of the stresses that we are feeling right now. I've, I've got some people that are uh, unbelievably stressed out. You know, Sean gave the testimony tonight of what he went through. These are, these are stress factors because God is he's making us decide in this moment which side of that demarcation line are we going to be on. Are we going to stay in the old era are we coming into the new era? Or do we value that or do we value this? Are we pulling that along with us or are we pulling that back? So er- new eras are actually like a rebooting or a resetting of a computer. The, God is resetting the origin points in our lives. He, it's like we've allowed the pendulum has sunk so far out, he's bringing it back to the center. He's centering it. He's resetting it. And when he starts resetting origin things in your life, here's what he starts, here's where he starts dealing with. First thing he's going to start dealing with is your identity. All the people that went into a new season all went into a new season because God gave them a new identity. You look at Abram to Abraham. You look at Saul to Paul. You look at Jacob. You can look at the, almost every single one that brought a new season into the earth went through almost an identity crisis to come into an identity from God and there was a demarcation line of when it happened and they moved into a new season. Uh, the other thing that God does right behind it is he addresses false functions. Those that are functioning in a false way. So you see, like, Ruth looks at herself as having no value but becoming a kinsman redeemer. We see the apostles going back to fishing. He says, no, I made you fishers of men. 
He changed their function, changed their identity, changed who they were, and it's because he raises up a new standard. And the, standards, the standard has to come so that that which is from God can be seen versus that which is not from God. And so when you start looking, and you can look, at, you can look in Hebrews, Hebrews 11, which is the hallmark of faith chapter, right? We all know this. But that hallmark of faith is actually a list of starting points of origins of new eras. That will make you look at that and read that whole chapter differently. That will give you like a major study right there at that single statement. Every single person listed there was moving by faith into a new era of God upon the earth. Every one of them was struggling with things in their life. Every one of them had to go through certain things because every era has hallmarks in it. And you can see that in Hebrews 11.33. And he starts listing what these, this new era that each of these people by faith had to pursue into. And so it goes like this. Who through faith subdued kingdoms? There was battles that had to be fought in that era that they birthed. There was opposition. They wrought righteousness. There was, they had to come into a right standing. You look at Abraham. You look at, you look at Paul. You look at every one of them had to come into a right standing with God. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. You see the extremes. He's like, you've been in the season of weakness. I'm taking you into the season of strength. You've been, you've been pursued by fire. I'm taking you into the purging of God's fire. All of these things. He says, wax valiant and, and fight. Turn to flight the armies of aliens. Women receive their dead raised to life again. Which I love the story that I know from Africa because I met the woman who actually on that verse raised her daughter had been dead seven days went out with a shovel and dug her up and grabbed her hand and confessed that verse over her. Women shall receive their dead to life again. And she had life come in her and took her home. Isn't that simple faith? You know what happened? She opened a new era for her and her family and the destiny of that child. All of those things started happening. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. What's starting to happen now in verse 35 is starting to talk about the sacrifices of a new season, a new era. There will be sacrifices that will have to happen in this new era. So he starts talking about it. 36, trials of crude mockings and scourgings. Paul was chased down like a dog. He was, he was well, you can read about it, but I mean, he was, he was everything but sawn asunder. That's what happened to Isaiah. They put him in a log and they sawed him in half. Did you know that? Did you know that's how Isaiah died? They put him in a log. They sawed him in half. It's the martyrdom of Isaiah. You can read it in that book. And when he was sawed in half, he prophesied the, prophes the prophetic words over the men that were sawing him in half. And that's how he died. He died prophesying. They were, when you see, they were sawn asunder. That little, that, they were sawn asunder. That has that whole thing behind it. That's why Paul wrote it. He's like, you think you got troubles? Are you in a log right now? And are they sawing you in half? And how would you react? And didn't you remember that he prophesied and was in the spirit just like everybody else that died? Sawn asunder. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves. Remember who was in dens and caves? David. Joseph in prison. You know what? They were in the, they were in the demarcation line to come into the next season when they were in those places. 
we've actually probably been in a demarcation line for a long time as the church, as the body of Christ, to come into this next season. It says, These all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So there was a, there's a time and a season, all the time, there's times and seasons upon the earth. We can read about it in Ecclesiastes. We can read about it in all kinds of places. Ecclesiastes says, everything, there is a season, which means a set time. There is a set time of preparation for you. There is a set time for you to get yourself together. There is a set time of invitation for you. And if you don't respond to that invitation, you will miss your season. There is a set time for you to put your hand to work. There is a set time for you to sleep. I mean, it goes through it, doesn't it? It says every time has a purpose. Everything that we do in life, there is a direct purpose related to the plan of God, whether you see that plan or you don't see that plan. I was listening to David Alley from the summit over in Australia this week, and he was talking about, and it, it went kind of like this. We're all sitting here today, and we're all doing the things of our season of time upon the earth. We're raising our families. We're raising our kids. We're taking our kids to ball games. We're buying groceries. We're cleaning our house. We're mowing our yard. We're doing the stuff that we do for life. We're trying to witness to our neighbor. We're trying to live a godly life as an example. We're living life. And while we're doing that, though we don't feel God's doing anything, God is still doing something. And in the last hundred years, the acceleration of Christianity has been staggering. A hundred years ago, it was roughly one in 21 getting saved. Today, it's one in seven getting saved. The acceleration of God, and yet in the last hundred years, we haven't really had an awakening that's covered the earth like other seasons upon the earth. But yet as the church and as Christians and as we just do our stuff every day and live our life, God is still doing something in the midst of it. And I find that just amazing. In Catholicism, there is a move going on right now in Catholicism. Catholics are getting spirit-filled. There's moves that are going on in denominations. You know, uh, the Mennonites. The Mennonites have 13,000 spirit-filled people sitting in the Mennonite churches. There's a move that's quietly going on in there, quietly going on over here, quietly going over there, and we're all wanting this big blow-open thing because we think if we don't see that, God's not doing something, and yet God is still doing something. Now what's happened, everybody's saying there's a season, there's an era that's emerging. Something, there's a closing of all of this that God has been doing, and God's about to blow something open into a new thing over here that we've not yet seen. Now what does that mean then? What does that look like if this is an intentional thing of God that God is going to start to move? So everything that God is doing has a purpose to it. There's a purpose why you're here tonight. While you're spending your time here tonight, there's a purpose to it. There's a purpose of where you'll spend your time tomorrow. There's a purpose of what I'm going to do at this place that I'm going to go who's asking me to come be a part of things. I mean, there is a purpose to every single thing that we do in our life, and yet sometimes we don't connect that purpose to God. And yet there's a purpose behind it. We went to Laura's uh, art thing last night. Then we meet Kathy's person who gave her guitar lessons. I mean, it was crazy. Deb meets up with somebody and makes a connection. It was just crazy. And you walk into the room, and there's like 20, 30, maybe there's 40 people that floated through, 50, I don't know. And you're in, and you're in this thing, and you're wondering, what is the purpose of me being here? I'm supporting Laura and, 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 you know, endorsing that and just being there for her. But what's the purpose of me being here? And then it's like, this happens, this happens. I talked to, talk to Greg. I talked to Greg a while. And it's a connecting thing there. It's going on. And it's like, there is purpose every single place you go. We met Laura's mom. Helped take the edge off of that. You know, 
Now, here's what's happening. God is doing these things, but we, we end up not being moved by what God does, which is very sad because we're having a hard time seeing him in the midst of it. And what happens is we let the season that we are in dictate our definition of God in that season. And God is not moved by the seasons. He's not moved by, he's not moved by what mo- is moving us most of the time. He is moved by faith and knowing he has a plan that's sovereignly unfolding and it's going to unfold whether we see it or we don't see it, or we participate in it, or we don't participate in it, there is going to be some major surprises in heaven. Major surprises. Surprises of us, God moving all around us, and us denying his moving. God giving us opportunities, and we missed the opportunity because it was like so in front of us, we missed it. Kind of crazy stuff. Things that we could have done, should have done, but didn't do. Things of how our life was to look different, was a different purpose and outcome at the end, but we got distracted by this over here, and we missed these opportunities that were coming right by us. So what happens is when you start taking an old season into a new season, you start frustrating the grace of God working in your life. Because God's grace is working in what he is doing. His favor and blessing and promise is resting where he is moving. He isn't moving in this 20 years ago. You know, my wife's telling those stories, but those are old stories. He's moving over here in something new today, something fresh today. So you have to close that past season off. You have to close it. You have to allow a new season to start coming. And even in this year, with where we're at, our, our, we didn't have spring. In case you missed it. You didn't get the memo, spring didn't show up. Summer came in. Well, why is that? Isn't that a prophetic sign that God, like, I'm changing the season so drastically, there isn't going to be just a drifting in. Here's a demarcation line. It's literally like a prophetic sign of we're moving from this season to this season and that in-between season that lets you transition is not going to be there because I'm moving over here and it almost tells me he wants to do something accelerated. He wants to speed up the season that we're in. He wants this. It's like I'm going to give you two weeks of spring And here we go into the heat and humidity of the year, you know? And it's almost like he's saying, I don't have, we don't have time for you to go through your transitional moments anymore. You've got to make steps in and close past and come into the next thing. And here we go. And that's, I mean, to me, that's literally what I see happening this year at the season. And I wonder if we're not, if we're not going to have the same thing in fall that we're just going to have an an endless summer and almost no fall, I hope not, and jump into winter. And if we do, that will really confirm to me that there's something there. Please, God, have fall. We need to be praying. We need fall really bad. Here comes the leaves. They're turned in two weeks, and they're dropped. Oh, gosh. I know, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. So in Acts 3.21, he says, whom heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things. There is a restitution in the season that we're entering into, the era. And what he's wanting to do is he's wanting to restore back to the way he intended in Genesis. And that, that same restoration, that word, restoration the time of restoration of all things as time is chronos there is a season there is a time a set time of the restoration of things it's the same thing in acts 1 6 where they said are you going to restore the kingdom in this season and he said well it's not for you to know 
the ta- these times and seasons, but it's for you to know the power and wait until the power comes upon you, which is the nature. It's as if he's saying, if you would have my nature upon you, you would know the time, the seasons as they come. But you don't have my nature, so you better wait until you get the nature. Then on down, it's asking, is this, is this the time of restitution and the restoring of all things? And he's talking about all things. And that's what I want you to really get a hold of, is all things. Because the doctrine of Christ of regeneration is the restitution or the restoring of all things. So we have been in a season where we've seen a partial restoration or regeneration. I honestly believe we're stepping into an era of a full regeneration of all things. We've been struggling to see healings come, but I think we're stepping into a season where healing will be common. We've not done much deliverance. We've done some, but I think we're coming into an era of like unbelievable deliverance supernatural deliverance even the testimonies tonight were along that line of de- of like bam deliverance and we aren't sitting here belaboring it i think we've had promise of provision but i i honestly believe that we're going to step into unbelievable provision unbelievable provision i had a businessman yesterday make a commitment to send me monthly support to get me out of working. See, it's like, can you? I mean, it's like I'm in. I've stepped in. You see, I've stepped in. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And it's like, and this is coming. And this is coming. And this is coming. And it's all came in like about three days here. So it's it's like it's a different season. And I think in this season, where God's taking us back to origin points of His heart, and Origins of passion, origins of pursuit, origins of zeal. I think he's taking us back to origins of passion, the Christ, having a passion for Christ like we've lost our passion for Christ. And getting us back to what we should be focused on. And then our origin of pursuit is the kingdom. And we've pursued gifts and Holy Spirit activity and all line up and all fall down and roll around and all kinds of stuff. But he wants us to pursue the kingdom. Because then he say that if you would seek first the kingdom, all these things would be added. All these things. And that's what I'm, I'm going to focus on all things. So I want you to remember that. So all these things, if you get, you get back to the origin point and our zeal. And, and it's like, where is the zeal that we have? For the body of Christ. Seriously, for the body of Christ. You see, it had been very easy for me to take that text message tonight and said, I've had a problem in the past, and we've had conflict. I'm not doing that. But where is our passion for the body of Christ? And then sitting here thinking, okay, what kind of message am I going to (laughs) bring? Because this is my chance. You know what I'm saying? This is my opportunity to align and order and this and that and release and do to do. It's like this is my moment. So another place is Galatians 4, verse 1. And it says, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth not from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. That there is an appointed time to grow up. I think we're in the era of growing up. He's about to grow the church up in an unbelievable, accelerated rate. And he says, until the time of the appointed of the Father, that we're coming into an appointed time of the Father in this new era. And then he says, even so we, when we were children... We were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son. So now he's saying that there's also seasons of fullness of time. There are times where something dramatic happens. Here comes a new era, and it's the era of the son of God in the earth. And by that moment of time of the cross, 
whether you like it or not, your money says in God we trust. Whether you like it or not, your calendar evolves around that moment of time. It's amazing how many things are evolving that we don't even realize or take for granted around the moment of time of when the sun came. So, now we don't go there. Let's go further down. So here is the sum total of all things of the kingdom. Here's what God's trying to do in Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation, which is an era of time, the, of the fullness of times, plural times, meaning plural chronoses, I feel like we have overlapping times right now. We have had a season of prayer. We have had seasons of worship. We've had seasons of prophetic flow. We have had seasons of the apostolic. We have overlapping times. You see what I'm saying? That in the era, the dispensation of the fullness of all of those things, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. All things in Christ. This is the end game plan of everything we're working towards. And everything that God wants to do in the earth is to gather together all things that are in Christ, every single thing that is there, every gift, every talent, every ability, every person, every person in the body, the ecclesia, which is not everyone in the body. You'll find out about that at Summit. Not everyone is ecclesia. It is a group that's within, that's called to govern and rule. Not everyone's the bride. It's those that are pursuing intimacy. Everybody is the body, but there are certain factions within that have certain rights and privileges because of their heart. So he wants to gather all of it, collectively all of it, meaning the sum total together in Christ, and then he starts saying, in heaven and in earth. So it's a gathering of everything that's setting in heaven of Christ and everything that's a gathering that's in the earth in Christ all coming together. That is, that is the end of the um, age. I won't get eschatological on it, but it's the end of the age. It's the end of all that he is wanting to bring us back into the fullness of what his intention was, and he's wanting to gather all things. So what is all things? See, if that's the end game, what is all the things that are going to be gathered? So you go to Colossians, and I'll just read off the list for you. It'll be easier than you trying to look for it. All things, Colossians 1, verse 9. Wisdom, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's going to gather all of it, all of our understanding together. We're coming together at Summit seeking all wisdom and spiritual understanding in that moment of time that will be present in the body that gathers of what God wants to do upon the face of the earth. Verse 10, all pleasing. He wants to gather everything that's pleasing in, to him, pleasing in his sight. Verse 11, all things that are strengthened with might, which is the nature of Christ. It is deutimus. It's 1411 in the Greek. All might. He wants to gather everything that's been strengthened with his nature. Verse 11 again, all patience and long-suffering and joy. He's going to gather all of it up at once. Gathering all this joy. I mean, I'm looking at Ezra, and I'm can't, I, like, here's this baby that just is so full of joy. He just smiles and laughs, and you're going to be 20 feet away from him, and he's looking at you to see if you can get him to laugh. It's weird. It's good, but it's like, is this a thing of, like, all things? Is this kind of prophetic or symbolic of what God's trying to do with us, you know, should have some form of joy. Jeez. 
Colossians 1.16, all things were created. He's going to gather everything that was created. In the same verse, and those things are created, all things are created for him, not for us. Amazing, we think everything's for us. No, it's all been created for him. Verse 17, he is before all things, meaning he has more value than the things themselves. He has more value than wisdom and spiritual understanding and might and joy and patience because he created those things. He is before all things. At verse 18, he has preeminence before all things or superiority of all things. Verse 19, he has all fullness dwelling in him in the Godhead bodily. The fullness is dwelling in Christ. He's gathering his fullness. He's gathering what the measures of it that he's distributed to everybody. Verse 20, reconciling all things. And you go into Colossians 2. You can read the whole thing in Colossians. Verse 2, all riches. Verse 3, all treasure. Verse 9, all fullness of the Trinity. Verse 10, over all principality. Verse 13, forgiving all trespass. He's going to even gather up trespass. Verse 19, nourishing all the body, how the body grows. He's going to gather how the body grows together. I mean, man, you talk about some stuff. Verse Colossians 3.11, I'll just read it to you. Wherefore, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Sith, Scythian, band nor free, but Christ is all and in all. He's going to gather all that he is in. That's why it's like we're doing the thing with global friends. Global friends is... We are forming one corporate man from every tribe and ethnos. We're not going down a belief system, even though that's kind of there. We're gathering from every tribe, from every tongue, from every ethnos. It is not from culture. Nowhere in the Bible is there a word that talks about gathering from a culture. So we're not gathering cultural groups. We're gathering tribes and ethnos and tongues and this and that. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. These are, th these are the things that he's coming to gather. So it's going to be like a gathering of song collection. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The songs that we sing that have been written down. The songs that we make up are being gathered. And they're going to be gathered in Christ at the end of the age. It's all going to be gathered. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything that we are doing is, being, is, is encompassing him. All of it is. Colossians 4.12 says, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He is going to gather up the will of God. What is the will of God? You all want to seek and find the will of God. And then we all go to, what is it, Corinthians, and we say the will of God is this, this, and this. And it's not, it's not degrees of the will of God. There are not degrees of will of God. It is either the will of God or it is not the will of God. It is not progressive will. That's goofy. I know it's 85% the will of God. I missed a 15% someplace. No, it's what the will of God is, what the will of God does, and what the will of God produces. That's what that verse is. But he's going to gather the will of God. What is the will of God? What does the word will mean? It means no longer needing to exist. Meaning something has been completed. He's going to gather up what has been completed in him. And see, that's, it's like all of this is, is this next era. All of it is heading into 
what we're about to step into. We're stepping into a brand new sound, a brand new way, a brand new understanding with a brand new purpose because every season has a purpose to it. So we're not just stepping into a something because you know what's happened? Here's what's happened. We have been living in a past season with no purpose. That's really what we've been doing. We grope around trying to find something. Well, maybe we should have a fire tunnel. Maybe we should have a fire tornado. That didn't work real good. We couldn't even get in a circle. It's all leaders. So I was like, oh, my God, no wonder we're a mess. We can't even get in a circle. It isn't going to be line up and pray and they all fall down. It isn't going to, we've groped here, we've groped there, we've tried to find it here. Maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should have lights. Maybe we should have pallet wood. Maybe we should do it like this. Maybe it ought to look like that. Maybe we need the Hillsong songs. Maybe we need to dress a certain way. And we've tried every single thing because we have no purpose. We have cultural influence, but no purpose. We are trying to be relevant to culture. Do you know what the word relevant means? That is, not a, that is not the right way to use that word to say that you're relevant. To say you're relevant means you have compromised so that people can receive what you're doing when you start studying the essence of it. There's a church in town called Relevant Church, which literally means we're relevant because we have embraced culture and we look like culture so you can relate to us in culture. And the church is counterculture. The church is completely opposite of the culture of the day, you see? But when we say I'm relevant to culture, it means that I've embraced the culture so the culture can embrace me. So we've, and why do we do that? No purpose. So I think what God's doing as we move into the next era is he is bringing back a new focus on our purpose of why are we here? What are we to do with our life while we're here? And he's going to take away all of this complication we've built and get us back to some foundational things that we build off of. And that becomes now more of the heartbeat of what we do instead of all this other stuff we're trying to do. And I, I don't know what Ray will do when he's here next week. I feel like he's going to talk about sound and there, there, are sounds, there are sounds that we are carrying. There are sounds that are dropping right now in, into the earth. There are sounds that we have to pursue. There are sounds that are going to create things in our midst. There is, there's talk of a whole new level of, of sound in worship beyond the prophetic sound that we're doing right now. And they're calling it apostolic sound. There is coming an apostolic sound into the music. No one knows what that looks like. But that would be a new era. I mean, that would be a crazy new era of something that's going to happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm watching. I don't know how many of you are watching. Do you see all of the new instruments people are building right now? They are building some really crazy stuff that puts out unbelievably crazy sound. And it's like, so there's something that's going on of a new era that we're stepping into. And when we step into this, these new eras, it's, it's, well, I'm telling you, don't fight what God's doing. Don't, don't try to judge that based out of where you've been. Just step in and let him work it out inside of you, you know? Because, boy, can you imagine, here comes, here comes Christ. Can you imagine all of the commotion that that messed with people? I mean, can you imagine, here comes John saying, get water baptized. That started messing with people to begin with. That is so contrary to everything else. So he's forerunnering a new era that's 30 years out. Well, 
wasn't really 30, it was more like three or four years because he got water baptized and went, but John's carrying the era inside of him and then releases it. It's, it's in the future. Then here comes Christ, and here comes the cross, and then here comes Acts 2, and here comes that sound dropping down. And I mean, people are like, well, this isn't how we did it. This isn't temple worship. This isn't, I don't see it here. I don't see it there. And it was a whole new era of doing things, a whole new approach of doing things. And we have gotten so accustomed to, like, this is how we do it. And God's like, yeah, but how do I do it? How do I want to do it? You know, it's like I've said, we're trying to build the church. And he said he would build the church. We're trying to build congregations. That was not the role of our job. Our job was to build and advance the kingdom, not build congregations and churches. And he said, I'll build my church, meaning I'll build the ones that I want to rule and reign. And I believe the early apostles, when you start, I started looking at all this, the early apostles weren't governing the church. They were governing the kingdom. And the church was inside the kingdom so the church was automatically governed because the kingdom was being governed. And then through that, then they said, oh, here's ecclesia and elders and bishops. They're going to rule over these, these decisions that have to be made. They're going to have a role in all of that. But they were being governed by this apostolic, apostolate council, you know, that we've talked about. All of this is like, and it's like resetting us, resetting us, resetting us, resetting us. And then, you know, here's what we all will, this is, I'm going to tell you the biggest struggle you're all going to have, and that is looking at what is existing and trying to figure out how to put a new era into it. You can't do it. What God is birthing is he's going to birth something new that this will have to come into it. Seriously. Seriously especially in America. You know, we're, we're sitting here thinking that if they don't come in, then it can't be God. That's what's really in the back of our minds. It's what we don't ever confess, but it's what's going on inside of us. So we have doubt about what God is wanting to do to bring us into the next thing. You realize the, he turned the world upside down with 12 men. And one of them betrayed him. And they fulfilled, they brought in another person to replace him. And those 12 took off and turned everything completely upside down. And it doesn't even make sense, does it, that 12 could do such a thing. But yet, you see, we, we, that was a new era. And when they embraced that new era, they knew that they had stepped into a new anointing, a new authority, a new understanding that God would already made the path for them. They were already walking down the path. They had stepped into something. And there's going to be some that are going to step into this that's about to happen. There's going to be some that are going to be watching from the sidelines again. And I, I think it's sad, but they're just, I just don't even know what to do with that. You know what I'm saying? But it's all, it's what God's intending to do in this hour. So I hope that makes sense tonight. I hope it, Starts getting us thinking a little bit with Ray coming in next week. You know, what, what does the sounds of a new era, what is setting in that new era, these sounds that are supposed to start coming forth? I think, there, I think this sound, one of the sounds has got to be travail. I think there's got to be real intercession, not patty cake praying. I think there's got to be passionate worship. I think there's got to be the word of God on our tongue in our heart but we got to get it on our tongue because see everything about it says something has to come out of us a sound has to emerge out of us so all right any questions clear as mud clear as clear can be it's got to walk it out you know it's got to walk it out it's it to me it's a privilege it's a privilege that we are we're setting in something like this that we would we would be able to do something with this. So, you know, the thing the thing that I see about Iowa right now is that we are um, 
we have a hard time changing. We have a very hard time changing in this state. We get complacent to be in the past and live there. If we're not careful, we'll miss our moment. But, you know, God will take whoever wants to go to the next moment. He'll just, like, you want to go, we'll go. And I think the other thing is we can't be, I think the thing, the other thing in this new era is it's going to be a whole new breed of people coming in. Whole different group of people. Probably some unchurched people, but some people that are seriously wanting something from God. And that to me is 